coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. And you notice just creating a little bit of discomfort in your daily routine, I think it starts to help you deal with day-to-day stress better. You know, once you start to lean into stress, whether that's through workout or fasting or cold exposure or even breath work, because that can sometimes be uncomfortable, it starts to to enable you to deal with day-to-day stress a little bit differently. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interviewed breath and mindset coach Avi Greenberg. We discussed his journey to overcoming addictions and depression through using his breathwork practice, along with powerful habits to start your day, developing tools for dealing with stress, advantages of cold immersion, becoming resilient through acute stressors, the importance of breathing through your mouth, and his one tip to get your body back. This was a great interview with Avi. So good that I've actually been using Avi um, every week to help me with breath work. So definitely worth a listen. Thanks so much and enjoy the show. All right. Welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. My name is Brian Grin and I have Avi Greenberg on. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Brian. Really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on. I've uh, I, I talked with Avi about a week ago, and I'm looking. I was looking for someone to come on to talk about breath work, and I believe you got certified with Wim Hof in 2018. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep, that's right. Awesome. Maybe tell us our journey, uh, your journey into learning about how you know breath and and all these stressors, uh, these acute stressors can can uh, help us in the long term. Yeah. Uh, so I found Wim Hof method just from, from just exploring different breathing modalities that were really popular at the time. And Wim Hof method was, was the one that popped up. Um, you know, I really wasn't even looking to get into breath work as opposed to just changing my lifestyle. I was, uh, in a rut and I saw a vice doc on Wim. It's about a 40 minute short documentary on, um, you know, his method and just a little bit of the background on his life. And I, uh, I took to it pretty well. Um, I downloaded his app and I just decided that I was going to dedicate my time, um, you know, in between work and in between life to practicing the method. Uh, it was breath work in the morning and then sauna and ice bath in the afternoons, pretty much every day. Uh, I was oh, wow. very diligent for, for, you know, uh, about a six month stretch, not, not ever taking a break and really just focused on, on, on the, the practice itself. Uh, and I found the breathing, um, the daily routine of the breathing really just opened me up in a way that I hadn't, I hadn't had in a long time. And then that spiraled into better eating habits, better sleeping habits. And it it sort of was like the tip of the spear for me changing my life. And, you know, what I tell people now is that once I started that daily breathing practice, my life changed trajectories. Uh, I was like on this path of sort of like, you know, not taking care of myself, not feeling good, being sort of low energy, uh, dealing with, you know, some, some addictive qualities. And then all of a sudden, the discipline of getting up every morning, going to my couch, doing 20 to 40 minutes of breathing, you know, and, and at that time, I didn't know, you know, the basics on breathing, whether I should breathe through my nose or my mouth or fast or diaphragmatic or chest breathing. I was just breathing however the app said to breathe, which was Wim at the time, Wim mm-hmm. guiding you, you know, saying, breathe in and let it go. And you just kept doing it and doing it. And, you know, I found myself really happy doing it. Um, after the first round, at least. Yeah. And so you, you came across this and then since, since 2018, you've sort of developed other or not developed, but maybe taken on other modalities of breathing. Um, and you, now you work, you work with people, you do workshops and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So after living in Miami, uh, I moved back to New York and, you know, luckily living in a, in a big city, like a New York or Chicago, Miami, LA, there's, a lot of different teachers of breath work. And at that time in New York, there was 
people coming through like Brian McKenzie and Dan Brule and even, you know, lesser known teachers and, and practitioners of breath work. Uh, so I would go to events. I, I take on, you know, one-on-one sessions with people and I would basically get as much information as I could on breath work. And I, you know, I didn't even do it um, so much to like figure out how to like develop my practice. I think I was just in that sort of sponge mode where I just wanted to try all the different flavors. Uh, and then, you know, also got all the literature, all the books out there. I mean, my laptop's literally on a stack of breathing books right now. And uh, it's uh, it's a passion for sure. But then it started to become, you know, the idea of it becoming a career slowly, tra- you know, it transitioned pretty, pretty slowly. Uh, I was working in tech at the time. I was working for this sustainability company. Uh, and, um, you know, was, I was kind of in the nine to five grind. And then when I got certified, uh, I started teaching workshops in the city. I was doing like one every three, four weeks uh, at a gym called Burn, a cold gym in the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were doing ice baths, breath work. And I didn't really follow the the sort of protocol of doing a Wim Hof workshop. I started to go on tangents and just really talk about, you know, people being unhappy and sort of like my story, but, you know, trying to help motivate people to get out of their funks, or if they're anxious, find ways for them to breathe slow and calm and just started putting in like a little of my own, my own flavor into the workshops. Uh, So that's, that's how it got started and it's transitioned since then. And and regarding your own story uh, on your website, you mentioned you were overweight and depressed and suffering from addiction and probably people like who are maybe, maybe a little bit more on the traditional side are like, Oh, how can you, how can breath work actually help you through this? What would you say the reasonings behind that? Yeah. Um, so my addictions were, were mostly, and you know, people might not think of them as that severe. It's pretty common addictions. Actually it was, it was, there was a food addiction happening, uh, like binging at night. I was having a, a, a bit of a marijuana addiction for about 20 years of daily, daily habit of smoking pot every night after work. And really also just like watching TV and just coming home after work, lying on the couch, smoking pot and eating every night for 20 years straight, it felt like. (laughs) And, and, you know, that, that has such a debilitating, you know, effect on your sleep, on your mood, on your energy, on all those different things. You know, I was waking up every morning more tired than I was at night before bed. Uh, and I was having to like sedate myself with pot to go to sleep. Uh, it was this crutch. And um, I found in the breathing practice, the discipline of getting up every morning, forcing myself to wake up earlier than my body wanted me to, because I was tired from all the pot at night and the food that the breathing allowed me to relax that part of my brain that was dealing with the addiction, that part of my brain that was dealing with the cravings that like that part that really needed that, that release, that dopamine, I was getting it from the breathing. I was getting this like rush of euphoria and excitement and calm and peace, all these different things. And that's the interesting thing about Wim Hof breathing is that the initial point of like breathing is, is up regulatory. It's raising your adrenaline. You're basically going or whatever, you know, nose, mouth, whatever, but you're breathing fast and you're pumping your adrenaline up with that sort of fast breathing, that rhythmic breathing. But in essence, you're also releasing all that carbon dioxide and it's putting your body into the state where it can go into a long breath hold. And in those breath holds, you get this really calming effect. Uh, Your heart rate slows down, your blood pressure slows down, your body just drops into this really deeply relaxed meditative state. And I always tried to meditate earlier on in life and could never feel like my mind would slow down. I never feel like I would relax, but something was happening to me in these breath holds where that feeling of I'm in this meditative state was actually happening during these extended breath holds. And at the time I was using the app. So the app allowed you to, to register your holds. And I was going from like a minute to a minute and a half to two minutes to two and a half minutes, sometimes three minutes. And you have to be really calm to hold your breath for three minutes, whether or not you're, you know, breathing hard and fast and dumping all that CO2, you still have to find a calm space. So something was definitely clicking there for me. And then I started going into the cold and the first like 
five, six, 10 times were brutal. I didn't like the cold at all. Like everyone always says, you go to a workshop and people are going to do an ice bath. And the first thing they tell you is like, I hate the cold. Most people do. We're conditioned to not go towards the cold. We're conditioned to feel comfortable and relax and not have to deal with that. Um, I was like that. I was jumping into this cold plunge every day and I was having no idea how to relax in it. But then I started kind of breathing a little harder in there as opposed to like holding my breath and going into like a freeze state and just locking up. I started actually like breathing almost like I was blowing a balloon Mm -hmm. and I found that helped me relax. And then all of a sudden things started to click from there between the cold and and the breathing and transition happened. Well, yeah, it's amazing. And like you talk about one thing sort of leads to the next, like once you, once you got your, once you got into a routine of doing breath work, it sort it like was a snowball effect and it created a positive cascade of outcomes that obviously helped you know, get out of a bit of a funk that you were in <clears throat> for 20 years. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and that's why like I, you're starting to hear breath work more. I mean, I'm, I'm curious to know, like, are you starting to, is it becoming a little bit more mainstream or are more people are talking about it? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think, I think things like, you know, the James Nestor book obviously was like a big shift in the community. I think the fact that COVID's, you know, mostly a, a respiratory illness became mm-hmm. a big factor. Um, I think the fact that people have been burnt out even pre pandemic, you know, and stress is, is probably at some sort of all time high in our modern society. Um, you know, I think that the addictions, you know, that I talked about that seem benign and not, not that severe are, are prevalent. You know, I think the fact that people are struggling with sleep these days, I mean, you know, eight out of 10 people I work with, when I start with them, they tell me they have issues sleeping at night. So I think all these reasons, um, you know, breath work, it's an ancient practice. It's a lot of, it's a lot of these other things in the world that happen, you know, it's these ancient practices that, that people, you know, they gravitate back towards um, yeah. when when they feel like they need it. You know, it was nice and calm until my my dogs just saw yeah. it here, but we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, they, they, yeah, my dog's starting to stress right now. He needs he needs some breath work. It's funny though you say that. I have a lot yeah. of clients that I do breathing sessions with, and we start the session, and and their dogs are barking, they're like worked up, and then the people actually as they're breathing and they're going into a deeper, deeper, relaxed state, the dogs actually most of the time end up sleeping right next to their owners. Mm, very relaxed, very calm. I think the dogs read their nervous systems and feel safe. Yeah. I could believe that a lot of times you can tell a lot by a dog because it, they're very similar to their owners. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Um, so anyways, what, you know, along with breathing, like I know you talk about cold therapy, cold plunging. I love that. I, I, we talked a little bit before we went on, on the year and, uh, I put a cold plunge back in my, uh, I was lucky to, to have one put in my house. And I, I agree. I think it, it's, it's like, you know, we talk about having building like a fasting muscle where, you yeah. know, you start fasting, it's uncomfortable. And, um, you know, same thing with the cold and, um, what would you say, what are good ways to implement the cold? I know you were doing it for a while there. I don't do it quite every day. I probably do yeah. every other day, depending on, on how things pan out. But um, what are good ways to utilize the cold? Yeah. And I, I don't do it every day anymore. That was just a period of time where I just shifted. Right. Now, um, I think I like to do it on days where either I've just worked out like I, and it's like kind of like a post-workout recovery mm-hmm. you know, uh, tool or there's days where like, I don't really feel like going to the gym or doing something too strenuous. And maybe I won't even put ice in my tub. Like I'll just fill it up with water and it'll be like about 60, maybe low seventies. And I'll just hop in and I'll just sit in there. And sometimes that can be enough. You know, it doesn't have to be this strenuous, like, all right, we got to get like the water down to 40. Cause that's what I heard on the Rhonda Patrick podcast. And Huberman said this, like, sometimes it's just putting yourself in a slightly uncomfortable state and slowing your breathing down is more than enough. The cold plunge I used to, st- I started this whole practice with, it was in, it was in Miami beach. It was outside. Yeah. It was this hotel spa that had it. And some days it wasn't in the fifties. Some days it was in the sixties and some days you just got in and it still took your breath away. I mean, when you right. get into 60 degree water, it's still going to have, you're still going to have a shift. So I think for, 
people starting out, like, instead of, you know, it always happens at the workshops, people are always like, well, how long should I stay in? I'm like, how about you just go in and you relax your breathing and you can see from there how long you should stay in. It shouldn't be this, it doesn't always have to be such a quantitative experience. So with that in mind, if you don't have a cold plunge, because I know it's not always accessible, sometimes just blasting yourself with the cold water at the end of a shower is enough. And just getting your breathing to change and then focusing on slowing your breathing down and relaxing your breathing. A lot of times, you know, we instructors of cold, cold, you know, therapy tell people just 30 seconds at the end of your shower and go from there. And then you slowly start to build that practice in. And, and you notice just creating a little bit of discomfort in your daily routine. I think it starts to help you deal with day-to-day stress better. You know, once you start to lean into stress, whether that's through workout or fasting or cold exposure or even breath work, because that can sometimes be uncomfortable, it starts to to enable you to deal with day to day stress a little bit differently, a little bit better. And I'm, you know, I'm I'm still someone that can struggle with day to day stress. It's not like I've achieved this level of now I never get stressed out during the day. I still get annoyed when I'm driving and someone does something ridiculous on the road. I still get annoyed, you know, my baby won't <laughs> stop crying and it's hard mm-hmm. to go to sleep at night, things like that. But you just start to become more aware of your breathing in those moments. Like you start to notice, oh, wow, like I'm like breathing through my mouth now, or I'm breathing up here in my chest, or I'm like gasping, or I'm sighing, or I'm holding my breath. And then once you can have that breath awareness, you can at least change the way you're breathing. And your nervous system will most likely follow suit, your body will start to realize, oh, well, now the nose is is being enabled in your breathing, you're slowing down the exhales, you're like, taking a couple like, bigger, fuller breaths, the body will start to relax. Like it's just, it's just how it works. And it takes, it takes sometimes as few as like six breaths just to lower your heart rate and blood pressure. It's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be this grand practice. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's our daily, it's our, you know, it's the daily constant, you know, it's 23, 25,000 breaths per day. And if they're off or they're short or they're shallow or they're through the mouth, the body and the nervous system will respond accordingly. So just creating that awareness. And I think the cold is a really easy way to notice how you're breathing. When you get in the cold, you know, if you drop in and yesterday I did an ice bath and I've just kind of getting over my first stint with COVID ever and my body's still recovering. And I'm telling you, the cold is kicking my butt. Everything's really kicking my butt, but you can, you can really get a good measure of where you're at once you hop into the cold. Like if you're in a really calm, relaxed state, you can breathe very easily once you drop in. But right now, like my lungs are kind of filled up with fluid and my body's a little bit more inflamed than it's used to being. And I'm just more aware of those kinds of things. So I hop in the cold and the first time my body's like, get out of here. And, uh, you know, got to listen sometimes, you know, I had a guy at a workshop on Saturday that asked me, cause I normally in the first workshop, I try to have people go in and in a really safe way. Um, you know, minute, minute and a half. If someone's done it before, we can go a little bit longer on their first cold or their first ice bath. But this guy basically comes up to me and he's like the third or fourth person to go. And I have two tubs. So two people are going at once. And he goes, Hey man, can I go in longer than, than what you're basically telling everyone to do? And I was like, well, why don't we just see how you do? And then we can go from there. But already in my mind, his, his thinking is not where it should be. He's not even thinking about like, this is going to be really hard. He's like, I want to do more. So he goes in and has a somewhat negative experience. He's like clenching. He's like squeezing his whole body. He's trying to like muscle through, which I'm sure, you know, you know about, and he's just really like tensing everything. I mean, I could see on his face, he had every muscle clenched and he got really like lightheaded. He got like, like he wanted to almost faint and I had to pull him out and I had to kind of like hold him for a minute and bring him out. I mean, you know, forget time. Like he just didn't have the right experience in there. And I felt bad because I knew he wanted to really like do something and it was really important to him. But sometimes we get in our heads on times and length of, you know, of workouts or this or that. And sometimes it's just, it's more about a qualitative experience. Can you go in? Can you relax your breathing? Can you slow your breathing down? Can you actually have like a moment in there where you feel the shift of, it being at a highly stressed, like an acute stress moment to a calm or relaxed moment. Can you actually feel that dopamine hit you and your body actually like drop into this really calm state? So 
you know, everyone's different, but it's important to be in tune with what your body needs. Yeah, I agree. I think someone starting out, like you mentioned, I'm, I've said it before, like even just a little bit of a cold shower, just get used to that. You yeah. have to build some tub in your, <laughs> yeah. in your, in your backyard or in your basement. Um, or, you know, like you said, using your own tub, like I was using my own tub for a while before I got like the actual cold plunge where it makes it a lot easier. Totally. Um, so you got one of, one of those cold plunges in the backyard. Yeah. Yeah. I have, um, <clears throat> I have, I have it in, we have a, it's like almost like a sunroom and I put, it's like a perfect spot for a cold plunge. Nice. Yeah. So, uh, it's been great. And I agree. I don't utilize it. Like you mentioned, I don't utilize it every day. I, you have to like, you, you have to sort of be in tune and be like, I think too many stressors obviously isn't good. Right. So if you're totally. stressed out all the time yeah. and, and you're doing fasting and you're cold, doing cold therapy and, and, and warm therapy and working out, you know, these are all stressors. I think, you know, you sort of have to balance it out. What are your thoughts around that? Totally. I think, I think you can totally get a burnout from pushing yourself too much. And I, I, I work with people that that's kind of, that's how they operate. You know, they, they, they're high performance, whether that's, you know, in their work dynamics or, you know, I work with an ultra marathoner. I work with another guy who runs marathons, like, you know, 10, 12 a year. And, you can definitely push yourself to the to the point of not wanting to do things. And I always tell people that that when you're doing the cold, if you stay in too long and you get too cold and you're not comfortable the rest of the day, you're going to start to create this sort of negative experience in your head right. where you're like, I don't really want to get that cold. Um, and especially out in nature, you know, cause you know, you go out to like a stream or a Creek or a Lake, or even jumping in the ocean when it's winter time, which, you know, I've done a few times, you have to be really careful. You have to be really mindful. It's one thing, you know, you're in Chicago, I'm in Salt Lake. It's hot out. It's hot out in the summer. So if I jump in my ice bath and it's really cold and I'm shivering and I get out, I mean, what am I, what is it going to take me 10 minutes to warm up? I mean, I'm lucky enough. I have a sauna right next to my my ice bath. So I'll hop in the sauna and I do contrast therapy. But if I'm out on a hike up in park city, there's this hike I like up here that's called blood's Lake trail. And, uh, it's got a lake. It's about a two mile and a half, two mile hike. It's at elevation. So it's like a nice mild workout getting up to the lake. And, you know, I've gone to the lake days where it's snowing up there. One time, the first time I went, there was actually ice over the lake. So we kind of broke the ice and jumped into the lake. Mm -hmm. If you're not careful in those experiences, even if it is just a mile and a half back to the car, if I overdo the cold in that lake and I don't know how to get myself warm after and I'm shivering the rest of the day and freezing the rest of the day, it's kind of it's going to kind of create this like stressor in my body that that stays a little bit too long. Like you mentioned earlier, acute stress like that's so important is that it's this short burst of stress that you figure out a way to down regulate from and relax from. And then you get that dopamine. If you push it too far, that's when it gets dangerous. That's when you start to kind of get a negative sort of connotation in your head from that experience. So, you know, everyone's wired differently. You know, like my ultra marathon uh, client, like, I mean, most people can't go out and run 26 miles just because it's Thursday night. And that's part of the training regimen. And that's mm -hmm. what she does. And she rides her bike for 60, 80, 100 miles because it's Sunday and it's like a recovery day for her. And I don't know a lot of people that are wired that way. So you have to be really mindful of what your body needs. And same goes for like fasting and things like that. You know, you have to be really sort of careful with these things, especially when you're just getting started. Yeah. I mean, these are all tools, right. That we can all utilize. And that's the cool thing about like just breath work in general is everyone can do it. It's free. You know, it's the same thing with fasting to most, you know, I would say 95% of the people, you know, could do some type of fasting. Yeah. Um, and it's free. It's, it can be easy after a while. It, it, it takes time, but with breath, breath work, something for me, I've, I haven't gotten a ton into, I do yoga and I do a little bit of meditation. And then I, I do find that, like you mentioned, the cold has to m m sort of has to force you to focus on your breath and, and, yeah. and really become better at using, um, breathing as a tool to, um, to combat any type of stress that you're feeling. Yeah. But then like you mentioned, you, you know, you don't say you'd practice breath work, like with a capital B too often, but 
if you have a yoga practice, you're so focusing on your breathing. You know, yeah. I, I hated yoga for years. I used to get dragged by all my ex-girlfriends to yoga classes. And I was like, what is this? Like, why are my hands and arms constantly shaking in these downward dogs? Mm -hmm. And I was in good shape, like even with the pot and everything, like there were periods of time where I was in really good shape and, you know, I was a, a functional pothead, but I could <laughs> never make it click in yoga. Like I never understood it, but then once I started doing breathing every day and I went back to yoga, I was like, oh, if I'm in downward dog and I just breathe calmly and I focus only on my breathing, then I can actually stay here for quite a while and I can actually go deeper into the stretch. And then all of a sudden this, this big click happened in my, in my mind and in my body. And I started going to yoga all the time. I was mm -hmm. taking a, a class three, four days a week with, you know, one of New York's best teachers of yoga and in my mind, one of the best teachers of yoga in, in the country. And, um, you know, he, he pushed this, this morning class it was 7am class three days a week. And then on yeah. Saturday it was a 9am class. And it was really like a 75 minute, no heat, no nothing, no music. We used to just joke. Mm. There was no BS about the way he taught. It was just the yoga and the stretching. It wasn't like, you know, this esoteric experience, but he was as knowledgeable as, as anyone I knew in yoga. And, um, it forced me to focus on my breathing. And for that period of time, I actually didn't really do any other breathwork practices right. unless I was going to like a different thing or trying something new. That was my breathwork practice. It was that class because we had enough time to really sit with our breath and sit in the poses. So even now, like there's periods of time like now, like I don't, I didn't wake up today and, and do a breathwork. I, you know, did a session before this, we're having our talk. Later today, I might go on a hike. And on that hike, I won't listen to music. I won't talk. I'll just focus on my breathing for an hour and a half while I'm climbing up a mountain. And that's my breathwork practice. Like now it's become this thing where it's it's how I, I look at my life and how I'm feeling. And I focus on my breathing pretty much throughout the day. And I focus on if I can feel my heart beating, if I can slow my heartbeat down while I'm breathing, things like that. And it's, it's really actually a, a very nice way to, to have this practice become sort of more functional to your day-to-day -day life. Yeah, that's a, that, those are great points. And I think that for any of these like acute stressors that we've talked about, once you've sort of wrapped your arms around doing them, then I think like you can pick it pick and choose times to utilize them. You don't need to do them all the time and you can do them in different settings. Um, like for example, I, I'm a big golfer. So, <laughs> uh, I actually had a, a, a tournament yesterday. My wife caddied for me. This was the first time. Cool. And, yeah. It was really cool experience. I played all right. I, the last two holes, I did not play great. And, and, you know, I also coach high school golf. So I'm, 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 I'm used to seeing high school golfers who are just experiencing this now. And then, you know, I've been playing for a long time now, but you know, how you respond to different things and, you know, maybe a bad shot or a bad round, um, you can utilize these tools to help you in, you know, different areas of your life, uh, whether you're driving or playing golf and, um, and that's when it comes most handy. Yeah, totally. Did you, I mean, Mickelson, there's actually a great article. I'll send it to you after later today but he writes about the last major he won, how he's yeah. focused on his breathing and breathing's been a, been a big part of his sort of like resurgence at this later stage of his career and focusing on his breathing in between shots and having a breathwork practice. Um, because listen, golf is stress, like being out there, being in the sun, hitting good shot, hitting bad shot, you know, you know, it's just this sort of redundant sort of practice where you're hitting the ball, hitting the ball. And then, you know, if you're, if you're in your head and you're not thinking clearly, you're not able to reset after a bad shot, then, you know, I don't have to, I mean, I can tell you your whole round can go <laughs> into the toilet very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about just staying present really. You know, I mean, totally. <laughs> if you get too far ahead of yourself, you know, thinking too far ahead, or if you thought about a shot that happened 10 minutes ago, you know, yeah. none, of, none of those will, will, will really help you at all. <laughs> yeah. And it's the same for a lot of sports. You know, I, I played high school basketball and, you know, when you're at the free throw line and just having that same rhythm and form and breathing, I mean, I, I watch, you know, I'm a big Knicks fan, unfortunately, and I watch the Knicks play and, and, you know, I, I watch almost most of their games and, you know, I see the guys at the free throw line and I'm just watching them breathe. I'm like, all right, this guy's taking an inhale through his nose. Nice. You know, and then, you know, it was actually Julius Randle, like two seasons ago, he was an all NBA player. He was having the best season of his career. And then this last season, 
he was just off, like something was off with him. And, um, you know, you could just see it in his body language and the way he carried himself. And even in his breathing, he just looked exasperated a lot of the time. He looked mm-hmm. really frustrated and it, his game was completely different. I mean, he went from, you know, career numbers to really an off year for him and uh, breathing could potentially be something that these players at that high level could utilize. Cause you get to that level, golf, basketball, soccer, football, whatever, everyone's freak athletes. They're all top of the food chain, you know, right. top athletes. But what's, what's the difference? What's the thing that separates, you know, the guy that's scoring 15, 20 points in the fourth quarter versus the guy that goes ice cold is, is their mindset is the way they calm themselves down in these high level stress moments. And it's the same for the golfers. I would think at this stage, you know, they're all, they're all incredible, you know, but how do they relax when it comes down to it? You know, I don't, I don't follow golf, but I was watching sort of, I was like on ESPN.com this week. I saw was it Rory McIlroy was winning the British open for like most of it. And then something happened. And then this other guy won. And in my mind, that's typically like, you know, what, what can happen in these tournaments? Like there's a, there's a leader and then there's a, you know, dark horse that starts to come in and starts to get momentum. And they start to think that confidence, you know, is building and growing and they're getting just better shots in their field. They're just like kind of grooving their way into a win. And it's cool to see, you know, especially at that level that these guys that are, you know, the best of the best getting, you know, pressured into that situation. Yeah. I mean, regarding golf, it, it makes me think because I, I watched the open, the open, the British open, whatever you want sure. to call it. And yeah, Rory, you know, was leading all that whole final round and there was like this momentum switch and the putts were falling for Cam Smith who won it, and Rory, the putts just were just missing. And, you know, it's just a matter of centimeters or inches. Right. Um, but yeah, golf is such a mental sport and that's why I've always been interested in learning about breath work and these tools that you can use to help you when you're, you know, on the course. Um, one of them, w- w- which made me think was like trying too hard, um, yeah. you know, and I think like I think pressing, like pushing, like, yeah, yeah, pushing, pressing. And, you know, golf's one of those things where you have to give up control. Like you, you there's, th- there's things that are out of your control, yeah. like, and, and I think with breath work, with, um, meditation, sometimes people like, and like you mentioned that guy that got in the cold and he was like, Oh, I want to go for this long. Yeah, totally. Really just be like, almost be in too much control of what was happening instead of just sort of letting it happen. And same thing, like with golf, if you are trying to control too much and not just letting it happen, you know, that's when things can actually go. against. Totally. You. Totally. And you get in your head and then all of a sudden, you know, my dad's, you know, my dad's a big golfer and he talks about his friends, like one of his friends get, got the yips. And then all of a sudden this guy that was, you know, yeah. 10, nine, eight handicap, all of a sudden he's, awful and he can't he can't even like finish rounds and um Mm. it becomes and and happens in all sports you know you see it in tennis you know there's 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 like three guys that have basically won all the majors for the last 20 years you know there's they perform really well there's actually a a tennis player i went to the us open a few years ago i was back in new york and i saw this french player monfi um it's really big kind of like long you know strong tennis players, French guy, and, and just really bad body language, like always like putting his hands on his knees after plays and just couldn't, didn't have the mental game to like, really like take over, even though physically he's as dominant. I mean, you know, you look at him versus Federer. I mean, one guy looks like he could play in the <laughs> NBA also. And the other guy looks like, you know, a normal, normal human, but the mental game is just, is so different. There's actually um a, sh- a short doc on, on Marty Fish, the uh, U.S. U.S. tennis player, um, and it's a really great doc. It's a lot. Uh, it has to do with mental health and anxiety too. He was he came up with Andy Roddick at the same time in, in U.S. tennis. They grew up together. They played at the same like tournaments and camps, and basically lived with each other growing up. Um, and and Marty Fish was always kind of like in the shadow of Andy Roddick. Andy Roddick was supposed to be like the face of men's U S tennis for this generation. And he could never be, you know, the main guys, except for, I think one time he won a a major, Mm -hmm. but Marty fish one, one off season decided he was going to like towards the end of his career. He's like, I'm going to push now. I'm going to go as hard as I can. And he had this incredible season where he was like top 
six or top eight, um, you know, played really well, won a bunch of tournaments and like actually surpassed Andy Roddick for one season. And then after that, I think he started like press. He started like push too hard. Mm. And there's this sweet spot, you know, they, they call it in some, in some ways you can call it like flow state that mix between sympathetic and parasympathetic that, that mix between being like really calm in a high stress moment like what you're talking about with golf where you're just like mm-hmm. in the moment you're just letting the moment happen you're not pressing you're not pushing you're not trying to control too much you're just playing within your game and uh that moment can can be the difference between someone someone you know hitting it slightly too hard or hitting it just in that right perfect sweet spot and um you know breathing has a lot to do with that when you watch some of these UFC fighters and you watch like people performing, that's really like, that's as high stress as it gets in terms of a sport. You know, someone's trying to hurt you physically, like put you down and you remaining calm in that moment and not pressing or not making mistakes. I I've trained in jujitsu and, you know, if you're making mistakes in jujitsu, you're going to get punished for it left and right. You know, if you're calm and relaxed and you're able to slow your breathing down when the other person is gasping for air, that enables you to start to think more. You know, you can actually use your brain. You can start to use your training. You could just get into this flow where you're just, you know, reacting. Um, and I think for all sports, I think slowing down the breathing, I think sport is really the next, the next thing that, you know, especially professional sports is the next thing that breathwork is going to come into. And you're already seeing it with, with like some, some small and small po- po- points of, you know, Phil Mickelson mentioning it. Right. And obviously practicing it. There's another professional golfer. His name escapes me, but I know he's he's trained with a, a coach of a friend of mine who's who teaches breath work. Um, there's a, a fighter from New Zealand, Israel. I think he's Nigerian descent, but he's his name is Israel. He's the the mind wow. bender or something. He he trains. He big part of his training is breathing. Um, yeah. They do this like underwater trainings with this guy in New Zealand, Rob Wood. Um, Wow. it's it's getting more and more popular and you know you start to think the nba guys if they start picking it up and they start noticing their breathing because it's 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 low-hanging fruit for these guys they've already done a lot of the hard work now it's just the mindset training the the physical process is already there it's just how do you slow it down how do you like get back to basics in terms of breathing the ufc actually has a training center in vegas and they have some of the world's best performance training breathwork people out there and yeah. uh it's just it's just going to continue to evolve from there yeah that that makes a ton of sense and what would you say um you know you hear a lot about breathing through your nose yeah like if someone's getting into breathing like i for a little while there i was doing the mouth strips yeah at, 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 uh for sleep um like the somni fix over your mouth yeah yeah what are your thoughts around that and and just breathing in general if someone's just starting out yeah, I, I wear uh, mouth tape every night. Um, yeah. So I, because of uh, maybe it's my 20 years of, mm-hmm. you know, craziness, I, I still have the tendency, maybe it's just the way my, my shape, my face is shaped. Um, my mouth will drop and it open in sleep. So I tape my mouth. I used to use Somnifix. That's how I started. But now I use a 3M micro pore tape, like sports tape. Um, it helps me. It's, it's, it's a big part of my routine. I, I joked at my last workshop on Saturday, if I had to go to a desert Island and I could only take one of my, you know, wellness tools with me, I would take the mouth tape right. um, because sleep is just that important. And if you're opening your mouth and you're breathing through your mouth during sleep, you're not accessing the deeper layers, the REM sleep, you're not falling into that really restful, restorative sleep. Um, Plus your mouth has no filtration system. So it's not good for your teeth, your gums, your immune system is the first line of defense for your immune system. The nose filters and cleans the air, you know, people that suffer from allergies from, you know, constant sore throat, constant, you know, chest inflammation, chest, chest, um, you know, colds. Those are really easy ways to tell that you might be mouth breathing at night and think about it. It's seven to nine hours of sleep. And if you're working with someone and, you know, for me, it's like, I ask my clients, like, how are you sleeping? You wake up, are you more tired than when you go to sleep? Those are easy ways. Is your mouth dry? Is your throat hurt? Is your nose congested the moment you wake up? Those are easy ways to tell that you're, you're, you're breathing through your mouth. So that's, that's a one really easy tool. And I have a lot of clients that wear like the aura ring and the whoop band and all these different sleep trackers. And they tell me their, their scores are 
much, much higher when they wear the tape. Hmm. Um, it takes about a week or two, I'd say, to get used to. Like I had the box of Somni fix on my nightstand in New York for about a month before I actually started wearing them because I just didn't want to do it. I just didn't right. want to put tape over my mouth. And then <laughs> The first week, half the time it ended up on my forehead or my hair. I was taking it off in the night. Yeah. But then once it finally stayed on through the night and I actually woke up in the morning and the tape was still there, I was like, oh, wow, that's a big difference. Like the, the way I felt when I woke up in the morning was a huge difference. Um, so that's that's definitely a good way to start, especially if those things I mentioned are something you're noticing. Um Plus two, they, you know, there's a lot of neurological diseases. They're talking about like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you know, the gray matter in your brain, the part that like kind of gets sticky in your brain and that needs to be flushed out that happens during sleep, you know, like these illnesses and these ailments, like if you're someone that wakes up every night at 2 AM and you're on your phone, you go to get a snack from the kitchen. Those are the kinds of things that, that will have a, a lasting effect on your mental health as you get older. So deep restful sleep is, is critical. Um, if someone's just wanting to get started with a breathwork practice, I would tell them the easiest exercise uh, or the most basic that I think has the largest impact is a, a six breath cycle per minute. So that's six inhales and exhales per minute. Uh, some people like in for four, out for six. Some people like five in, five out. I personally like five in, five out. Um, I get into this flow with it when I'm like in recovery mode or I'm just trying to relax or maybe going to take like a little snooze or go to sleep at night. And I just go five in, five out. I close my eyes. I sometimes I'll even put a pillow over my eyes and go ahead. I was just going to say, so when you say five in, five out, are you saying you're saying five breaths or f counting the five? Five second inhale. So it's in for five, four, three, two, one, and then out five, four, three, two, one. And then, you know, I used to time it. I used to do set a timer on my phone and do it for five minutes. Uh, now I just, I just kind of do it till I feel good and I feel relaxed. Um, I start counting for probably the first two or three minutes. It's something I do in the ice baths too, which you have a cold plunge. It'd be a yeah. great exercise to do in the cold plunge because six times is one minute. You don't even need to set a timer. If you're trying to, you know, time your cold plunges, you can literally get in, relax your breathing, however long that takes. And then once you get your breathing relaxed, and this will actually help you relax your breathing. And that's sort of the goal I set for people at the workshops, as opposed to like, Hey, stay in for two minutes or three or whatever, get your breathing into a five in five out in the ice bath. And that's when your body's actually going to receive all the benefits of, you know, the anti-inflammation, the dopamine release, because you're calming your breathing. And if you can breathe five in five out in the ice bath, you're there. You're at the point you want to be at. So mm. I do that typically five minutes a day, sometimes 10. I mean, that's kind of like the breath practice that I use the most. I'll still do Wim Hof breathing from time to time. I'll still do some other things, but I find that's the thing that puts my nervous system in the calmest place and it puts me in a relaxed place. And it's the thing I could do right before bed too. That helps put me to sleep. And after a minute or two, I stop counting. I just feel the physicality of the breath. Like I feel my diaphragm expanding. I feel my ribs opening up and I feel my chest rising. And then the exhale, you know, if you take a full inhale, Brian, it's typically about four to five seconds. If you're taking a full proper breath, it's about a four to five second inhale. So it's diaphragm opens, ribs open laterally, chest rises. That's about four to five seconds. So you just start to feel that full inhale and that calm, easy exhale. And then all of a sudden your body just starts to drop and get more relaxed and more relaxed and more relaxed, especially now recovering from this bout of getting sick. You know, I kind of need more recovery. I need to be more sort of calm with myself. I'm still trained. I just went to jujitsu for the first time in a while. I've been hiking, but you know, I play tennis on Sunday, but my body's needing time to like recover more. And I'm taking those breaks by doing that, that exercise, you know, once, twice a day and, and giving myself that pause. Yeah. And so five in, and when we go, when you exhale, are you exhaling through your mouth or nose or does it not matter? Through the nose. It does. I think it does matter. Um, okay. So when you breathe, it's called the Bohr effect. You inhale oxygen and your lungs convert that oxygen to carbon dioxide. And then you exhale CO2 out. So when you're pushing that CO2 out, if you're utilizing your mouth, 
your mouth is a, a larger, you know, apparatus. So it's pushing more CO2 out, which sometimes in a workout is good. Like you want to re- your CO2 is building, not just from breathing, but also from burning energy. So you really want to get rid of it. However, if you have an intolerance to CO2, meaning your body gets really stressed out when the CO2 levels start to rise, then you're going to be an inefficient breather, meaning you're going to overbreathe. You're going to breathe more than that 23,000 times per day. You're going to be breathing heavier, harder, using your mouth more because your body's going to feel this sense of like, get the CO2 out and also needing more air. Mm-hmm. So the more you can use your nose exclusively on the inhalation and the exhalation, the more your body will relax with breathing, the more efficient you'll be with breathing. The nose also creates nitric oxide for your lungs and for your body. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator. So it helps the blood flow more vigorously through your body. It's a antiviral, antifungal. You only get nitric oxide through the nose and the nasal cavities and the lungs. Um, You don't get it through your mouth. The mouth has no filter. So even on the exhales, you know, if you're working with someone or you're, you're training and your, your throat's constantly getting dry, your mouth's getting dry, you know, you're, you're pushing out too much CO2, it's creating inefficiencies in your breath. So, you know, if you look at the top athletes, you know, some of the, some of the best marathon runners, some of the best runners are only breathing through their nose, you know, this UFC fighter, you know, um, only using his nose not pushing out all that extra CO2 because CO2 is not necessarily the enemy. You don't actually want to be, um, you know, incapable of handling CO2 in your system. You want to be an efficient calm breather. So by doing that, exhaling through the nose, uh, it allows your body to relax in high stress. So you don't feel like you have to over breathe. Brian McKenzie actually, you know, I think he's the one that coined this. Um, he looked, he was looking at breathing in terms of like, car shifts like car shifting a uh, manual stick shift yeah so think of like you're in your workout start out like nice warm up nothing too strenuous you're going nose in nose out cyclical calm relaxed breathing nasal in nasal out uniform breaths second gear nose in nose out so you're starting to build up the pace let's say you're out for a run you're in your second third mile you're starting to move a little bit more so nose in nose out non cyclical faster breathing non uniform breaths faster, pushing in more, pulling in more oxygen, pushing out more CO2, but still getting that filtered nitric oxide through the nose. Third gear, nose in, mouth out. So now you're pushing out more CO2, your body's burning more. You need to get rid of the CO2 at a higher volume. So you want to get out that CO2. A lot of times when I run, I try to top out at third gear. I get to third gear and then either I have to keep my pace steady there and and eventually get back to second or first gear or slow my pace down from third gear. You have fourth gear, obviously, and that's mouth in mouth out, cyclical, calm, uniform breaths, relaxed breathing. And then fifth gear, you have all out end of the race, end of the workout, whatever it is, non-cyclical fast, like Mm -hmm. you non-uniform breaths. I actually think there's a sixth gear too. Um, (laughs) The sixth gear is when you double inhale. So if you're running, oh, you start yeah. to you start to pull in more oxygen, and you can even triple breath. So to me, that's the sixth gear. But um, a lot of times, if I'm training or I'm working out, if I'm in good health and I'm feeling good, I try to stay at third gear. At yeah. the at like sort of like stay in first and second. But if I need third gear, I use third gear as I need it, and then I go back down to first or second gear. My goal in life is to breathe through my nose in everything all the time, if mm-hmm. I can. But there's also breathing practices like holotropic, transformational breathing, um, rebirthing, Wim Hof to a certain extent, where you're supposed to breathe through your mouth to go deeper, to go deeper into those like therapeutic cathartic states. Because, because the mouth is a bigger, you know, you're getting more volume. Yeah. Yeah, you're actually creating a higher alkalinity in the body because you're pulling in more oxygen and you're releasing more CO2. So you're pushing yourself into that state in an even deeper way. Um, Actually, though, you know, Patrick McEwen, who wrote The Oxygen Advantage, wrote that when you breathe through your nose, even though it's less volume, there's a higher uptick of oxygen delivery. It's like 10 to 20% higher oxygen delivery when you breathe through your nose, even though it's less volume. That's why, you know, 
that's not why, but we were designed to breathe through the nose. We were not designed to breathe through the mouth. We're like supposed to use the mouth in emergencies, like in real high, high stress, like, right. you know, running from lions and like hunting and like trying to survive moments, but not necessarily, you know, while we're sending out emails and calendar invites and, you know, <laughs> texting with our friends, you know, we're supposed to be breathing through our nose like 99% of the time. Yeah. And and it's not that easy. I, I definitely, because it's something that I'm more conscious of is breathing through my nose because I've just learned the importance of it, but it definitely takes some time to get, totally. to, get to get used to doing that. <clears throat> yeah. I'd say it takes, I mean, if you're really focused on it and you're mouth taping at night, you're doing the whole deal, it probably going to take you like 30 days. And yeah. I tell a lot of the athletes I work with, you know, that you're probably going to have to take a step back. You know, you're probably going to have to take a little bit of a step back in your performance because your body's not used to not pulling in all that air and push really it's pushing out all that CO2. Um, but once you start to raise your CO2 levels, then all of a sudden you start to hit like three, four more gears that you didn't even know you had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is great. And, um, so yeah, definitely someone starting out, start with the breath, uh, they could just do a simple, like you mentioned, five in, five out yeah. for a minute, right? And then just sort of build yourself up. Yeah, from there. totally. Six, six nasal breaths. Really, it could be even less, but six nasal inhales and exhalations is all it takes to lower your heart rate and blood pressure. So hmm. oftentimes, like people think that I need to have this grand, you know, expansive practice. Really, like if you just create more breath awareness, you just notice you're breathing more, you become more in tune with it and you keep your mouth closed unless you're talking or eating that right there is a huge, huge win. And from there, if you can start to expand on your inhalations and exhalations, you know, and then maybe work in box breathing or modified box. Like I love modified box breathing because, you know, it's an inhale, a hold an exhale and a hold, and you can play with the numbers. It's not set in stone that it has to be four in hold for four, exhale for four, hold for four. You can, really play around with those numbers. You can inhale for six, hold for 12, <laughs> exhale for 10, hold for five at the bottom and just play around and see what feels good because what might you might like, Brian, someone you're working with, or, you know, maybe one of the golfers you, you train, they might like something different and it might change based on day. And if you play around with it, you'll start to notice things in your body. You'll start to feel that tension from the CO2 rising or the oxygen leaving your body or the CO2 leaving your body. You're just like, wow, this is, this is interesting. And you become really in tune with what your body needs. This is great. And uh, yeah, you made me think actually right there with the, with the golf team was maybe having someone come in and do like you do, like workshops and, um, yeah. and have, you know, teach the, teach the kids. Cause I think if you could, you know, just teaching kids that are in high school about learning oh. to use your, oh my God. To totally. Use your I, I'm not even, I, not even athletes. I mean, I work, I'd say, you know, in the last two, three years, I've used to exclusively work with adults, but in the last two, three years, I mean, I, you know, I work with someone's parents and then all of a sudden like, well, my 14 year old, my 16 year old could really use this. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you're working with, you know, teenagers and high schoolers and middle schoolers. And it really, it really makes an impact and, and not just, not just in their well-being and their day-to-day, -day, but their sleep, you know, their, their performance in schools, working with a lot of college students the last year, mm. um, you know, that were, were struggling. They're having social anxiety. They were having, you know, just, just issues being back at school or not knowing if they're going to go back or, you know, being at home for long stretches that they weren't used to being back at home for. So, it's definitely helpful. And I tell them, listen, even if it's something that right now you're just kind of doing because you're supposed to do, you might notice in five, 10 years, right. this practice that we, we did for four, three, two, three months together, this might be something you come back to. This will always be a constant in your life. Breathing is the first thing you're born with. And it's the last thing you have before you die. You know, you and I both know you can go days without eating, days without drinking. You know, I got a, a two-year-old upstairs. You can go days without sleeping, but breathing is the constant and the stress for high school students. It seems like it's the biggest in the world for them now, but life changes, you know, all of a sudden you're responsible for your finances. You're responsible for people in your life um, as opposed to just yourself. And the stress, the stress doesn't change. Just, it just most likely will increase the thing that we can work on is how we adapt, how we respond to it, how we deal with it. And the 
like I said at the beginning, the lowest hanging fruit is your breathing. Like how you respond to stress is based on your breathing. And, you know, whether you're taking a, a test or whether you're, you know, going out on a job interview, you know, your breathing is going to, could potentially dictate how you do on those, in those moments. Like I remember just being out of college and being on this job interview for this, this company I really wanted to work for. Um, it was, I think it was, it was like a sports collegiate company. They, they, they basically were, uh, they owned all the intellectual property for all the sports like content. And I, I really wanted to work in sports, you know, all, you know, kids that like sports want to work in sports. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I'm gonna remember I'm on this job interview and I remember I didn't breathe for like what felt like three minutes. Yeah. Like I was talking and talking and talking. My face was probably turning red or blue. And then all of a sudden I took this like big breath in like this exasperated breath in. And I feel like in that moment, I was like, Oh my God, this is not going well. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, it, and, and, and I got the job offer, but it wasn't, it wasn't the offer that I really wanted. And I felt like I, I kind of blew it because I was so stressed out and I was so caffeinated and I felt like I had to be so on. And it goes back to what you said about pressing and pushing mm-hmm. and sometimes being really calm in a high level stress moment, like, especially in the corporate world, it makes other people more relaxed. You know, when you can be relaxed, when you're presenting in front of a mm-hmm. group, and my last job in tech, that's what I did. I'd, I'd be in, in front of CEOs and CFOs and I'd be presenting. And at this point I was dialed into breath work and I was dialed into Wim Hof method. I was taking cold bath, cold showers, cold baths, you know, ice baths, sauna, yoga, the whole deal. And I'd present and it was always easy. It felt calm. And, you know, my boss was always telling me like, how are you doing this? Like, how are you so relaxed? You know, you have monthly quota, you know, you're behind or you're ahead. Like you're always relaxed. Doesn't matter what you're doing. I was like, I'm just, I'm just in tune with my breathing. And, and I, and I walk and I voluntarily go into stress all the time. Like I take cold showers, I sit in, you know, ice baths and do breath work. And my body's very in tune with how to respond to stress. And that does carry over, you know, that really does carry over to your regular life. So I, I highly recommend it for your team or if there's anyone else that's, you know, in high school or young adults that are looking to, to take control a little bit more and have a little bit more autonomy in their well being and their nervous system. Breathing is a really easy way to do it. And, you know, it's not a one size fits all either. Definitely. And, um, yeah, this is such a great tool and something that we haven't talked on much on this podcast. So I'm glad that you, you've, you've come on here to share all this. And I noticed on your website, you do you have any upcoming events coming up where you do an, a, like sort of a retreat? Yeah. You know, I don't, I I'm actually, we're expecting our second baby in the next few weeks. So I okay. haven't booked anything out, yeah. but I actually, um, you know, there's a chance I'll be out in Chicago in um, in the fall uh, oh, cool. around marathon time. There's a, there's a gym called beyond B I A N. I was, <laughs> working with, uh, well, I heard the, about that. Someone just told me they joined there actually. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. So like a wellness, yeah. you know, they, they have everything from IV nutritional therapy. They have cold plunges. They have obviously yeah. training facility, but, um, it's a, it's a really a lifestyle studio. Um, and, uh, we've talked, we were actually thinking about doing something in the, in the early summer, but you know, it was just kind of hectic that time for me. I was back and forth in New York, but, uh, I'll definitely keep you posted. And, you know, I'd love to offer you a session as well, you know, so you could give it a try, you know, at any point in time, you want to, you want to take me up on that. I'm happy to offer you a one-on-one just to show you sort of what I do. Yeah. Yeah, no, that would be great. Yeah, if you come to Chicago, that would be outstanding. And um, all of your information for your offerings and things like that, that's on avigreenberg.com. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And then I also post occasionally on Instagram and I post workshop updates there and, okay. um, you know, back and forth between New York and Salt Lake City these days doing workshops. Okay, yeah, I'll put that all in the show notes. And um, yeah, this was great. I appreciate you coming on. And um, I, I think this is obviously a tool that everyone can utilize. And uh, young and old, and um, it's never too late, you know? <clears throat> yeah, totally. It really isn't. Uh, you know, I've, I've worked with people in their 80s and 70s. I've worked with, you know, you know, 10, 11, 12 year olds. Um, and, and if you could slow your breathing down, it's, it's a win for sure. Well, thanks again for coming on, Avi. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, Brian. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine and I appreciate that. Check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode. 
feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was. Thanks again and have a great day.